Live from New York City, it's The Gary Null Show. And now, your host, Gary Null. I was born in a little rock, had a childhood sweet... Hi everyone, I'm Gary Null. Nice to have you with us today. We're going to talk about how yoga really benefits our brain. A study from the hospital Israeli Albert Einstein in Brazil. And then we're going to talk about how supplementing a simple nutrient, folic acid, lowers your risk of diabetes and homocysteine, which can cause heart disease. And from the Washington School of Medicine, eating chocolate may provide relief from bowel disease. In preparing for longevity, we don't need to become frail as we age. And this is from the a university hospital in Poland. And that goes against everything that we've ever seen. And it's good news. Also good news from Poznan University in Poland. Ginkgo biloba is really helping with performance and boosting brain health. And a lot more on health and healing today. And then we're going to go to our environmental segment. And I'm going to give you an idea, specifics, of what's happened just in the last seven days around the world. And I'm only giving you probably under 1%. And yet that will take five minutes and you'll think, wow, you mean that happened? I didn't hear about it, didn't see it. These are significant events. For example... Yesterday and the day before, Kuwait had the hottest days on record in that area of the world, 141 degrees, so hot that trees were catching on fire. It was that hot. You couldn't go outside. And uh, and mind you, they're, they're under siege right now from Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Egypt. And they also are completely dependent upon importing all their food and and getting their water. So this does not bode well for that tiny nation. But then again, I can show you the same thing with all the other nations. We will today. And then we're going to go to our audio file today, and there we're going to look at Seymour Hirsch and the DNC emails, WikiLeaks and the Russian hacking story, and tell you the truth. Also, we're going to ask why is it that a non-commercial radio station, KPFA in Berkeley, California, been there for a long time, why is it they censored me and a lot of other people because they didn't like what we were saying? Now they're censoring freedom of speech of Professor Dawkins. Now he is an atheist and he has taken on Chris Hedges, the best brains I know, and he holds his own. He's not afraid to take his views out and share them with the public. You can agree or disagree, but at least we shouldn't, shouldn't be censoring someone. But they did. So you'll hear them explaining why they did. What a foolish, superficial, and counterproductive excuse. That station is out of control and has been for a long time, but so is Pacifica. And... So anyone who, on the one hand, when it comes to fundraising, which is almost all the time, and desperate for money, which is never-ending, you would think that they would at least honor the idea that, listen to us because we promote free speech. Absolutely not true. KPFA is the best example of that, but not the only example. We'll also today be hearing from a professor of African history, who lives in Africa. He's not African-American. He's there. And it's a short talk. It is Patrick Lumumba. And he gives us insights into who really built the British Empire, the German Empire, the French Empire, the American Empire, and all these empires. The slaves are not given any credit. He explains why they should be because they're the ones who did it. And he takes you on a history lesson, one that we have not heard, not from him. This is a person you've never heard of, probably didn't know existed. He's one of the most respected minds in all of Africa. 
So as you see, we have a lot to share, and I will also be having a talkback segment to today's program, and I'll give you that information in a little bit. But let's now go to the latest on health and healing. Older women who practice yoga, older meaning over the age of 40, have a greater thickness in areas of the brain involved in memory and attention. Now, this is what this study shows. Researchers found that even compared to other healthy, active women their age, yoga practitioners typically had greater cortical thickness in the brain's left prefrontal cortex. And that could be good news because, as the researchers pointed out, cognitive impairment from aging is usually associated with less volume in cortical areas of the brain associated with attention tasks and decreases in memory. So that's important. So yoga is helping your brain boost your brain, boosting your memory, and that's certainly all good. A separate study, this one from Iwa Women's University in Korea, South Korea, shows that if you take folic acid, you lower your risk of type 2 diabetes and homocysteine and the LDL, the bad cholesterol. Quote, folic acid supplementation may improve the cardiovascular health of postmenopausal women with diabetes, which, by the way, is a lot of women. In particular, folic acid has been shown to reduce homocysteine levels and improve vascular health in different study populations. So, if you're a woman from, let's say, mid-50s on, taking folic acid as a part of a 50 milligram B-complex each day would do you a lot of good and could help you with diabetes and heart disease. Most people like chocolate, but there are lots of different types of chocolate. Some chocolates just made with processed fructose, others with glucose, others with sucrose, white sugar, and those are not healthy. But if you're getting a high percentage of cacao, being being 70% or higher, then it's real high. And what you're getting, you're getting a group of compounds in that chocolate that are extremely beneficial for our body. And uh, here's what this study says from Washington School of Medicine. Quote, consuming protein-rich foods such as nuts and seeds and beans and yogurt and even chocolates may foster a more tolerant and less inflammatory gut environment, which could mean relief for people living with pain and diarrhea or inflammation of the bowel. These foods items contain an appreciable amount of tryptophan, an amino acid used in the buildup of proteins, which when fed in laboratory experiments led to the development of immune cells that foster a tolerant gut. So the findings indicated that a that these are very important. So that's why you want to have your plant-based diet with legumes and pulses and beans and nuts and seeds and chocolate. So that's all good. But get your chocolate without the milk. So don't get milk chocolate. And the latest study that I have shows that there is no appreciable difference between chocolate that is raw and chocolate that is not uh, because the polyphenols are not altered by the prep. And if you want a sweetener, get natural fruit juice sweetener or get uh, coconut sugar or stevia. From Opoli University Hospital in Poland, they found that age-related frailty and we've all seen that, people kind of shrinking and losing muscle mass. That's not because of age itself, because when I travel around the world, and I'll just give you one example. I was down in the Amazon, and I thought that I had appropriate uh, protection on. Evidently, I didn't. It was very hot. Remember, you're down in the equator, and... Uh, the leaves of the trees in and of themselves do not block all the sun. It still comes through. So I got a really bad burn. 
And there was a man who said, what you need to do is you need to put some coconut gel from a baby coconut, immature coconut. I'd never heard this before. After all, you know, when you live in the United States, you don't see baby coconuts. You see, you know, that which is fully mature with a white solidified uh, coconut as a uh, as an edible product. So this man then proceeds to climb a coconut tree. <clears throat> he had no belt on. I'm guessing he was, I, at that time I was in my late 20s, I was guessing he was in his mid-60s. He had m- really strong muscles. He was ripped. And uh, he got up there and he cut down about six and then scampered down. And I was just amazed at his athletic agility. And I couldn't have done that. And I was a marathon runner. And then he cut open the top of the coconut and took out all this gel and then put it on. He said, this is what you do. And he said, take these with you. And then about every three hours, do it again. Well, within three hours, there was no more sunburn. That was a very important lesson. So for those of you who might get a sunburn, hopefully not, you do two things. First, you take quercetin and vitamin C together. That will help reduce the inflammatory response inside the body. But then you put raw coconut gel from the immature coconuts on your skin. And there's also coconut water on there and pour the coconut water on also. That adds into the soothing because there's over 200 different polyphenols that are possible in the healing process. Just a little something. In any case, I've been to Italy where I was helping a farmer. The deal was that if I helped him, as I'm a farmer, I told him I was an organic farmer and I taught farming and beekeeping and and um, animal husbandry, but not animals to eat. And he looked at me a little strange. I said, people drop off diseased and sick and abandoned and abused animals and I get them back their health and then find sanctuaries they can go to and live out the rest of their life in and, and peace and, and love. And he appreciated it, though they were meat eaters. In any case, but not a lot of meat. Uh, That was a small part of their diet, he explained. But in return for him uh, letting me share a meal with him, and I was just interested in uh, the family dynamic and understanding more about their life, I would work all day and help him. And he just laughed at that. He was willing to help me and answer my questions. And I said, no, you know, a fair exchange. So I'm used to hard work. I get up at four in the morning. I don't go to bed till midnight. So I'm working all day, every day. Finding moments, of course, for you know, my friends and family and, and uh, the wonderful, beautiful creatures that I've been blessed to have in my life. And opera and ballet and, and uh, symphony and Broadway, off Broadway, all the things that are important. There's no reason living in New York if you don't take advantage of the phenomenal amount of culture that we have and all the unique and idiosyncratic behaviors. And uh, so I'm up there, I'm working, he's working. I'm quiet, I'm just following his lead. And there's no flat area. I mean, you don't find a hill at all. It reminded me of West Virginia, which is just all up and down. <clears throat> you go to Ohio, across the river, you got these beautiful big, you know, 100, 200, 500 acre flat fields, not in West Virginia. And so I was used to terrain, but we don't farm that terrain in West Virginia, except for ginseng. So I'm watching him, and I'm watching how for hours this man, who was 91, would go up and down this hill with a bag in front of him. He would pick different uh, herbs or berries, whatever we were picking in different rows. And every square inch of all this hill terrain was growing something, just in and of itself. And wouldn't you know I wouldn't have a camera? And I wanted so much to bring that back into a feature story. I, I was publishing in some major magazines at that time. And I thought, wow, I have never seen this. And I'll bet most Americans haven't seen this either. 
that you're farming what historically would be considered non-farming land, the sides of steep hills, ravines. So I we, we sat down, and I'm just looking across him at lunch, and this guy is, I'm guessing, around, no, he's not tall, he's around 5'10", maybe 5'11", probably goes about 175, lean and muscular. But the whole family was that way. Even the women were strong. No one was stooped over, no spondylosis, no no, uh, no curvature of the spines. That These people were mighty people. And that was not unusual, nor was it an exception in that area. And he said, yeah, we, we, we start at sunrise and we end at sunset. And we take our time. We have, you know, a light breakfast, a big lunch, and a small dinner. And we enjoy what we enjoy. You know, we, we don't feel that somehow we're deprived of something, so we should feel bad about it. And everywhere I went in the world where people continued to work, especially the land, even gardening, you saw the head. They didn't have that frailty. Now, why is this article so important, this article from Poland published in Frontiers in Physiology? Because we just give it as an assumed truth that the older you get, the more frail, weak, lacking in energy you must become. It's simply not true. This is directly due to our lifestyle. So if we're willing to re-energize ourselves and get out every day and do exercise twice a day, 45 minutes in the morning, 45 minutes in the evening, including resistance exercises, sit-ups, push-ups, dumbbell weights, and power walking or jogging or biking. And then if we take a plant-based diet and supplement with some branched-chain amino acids and creatine monohydrate and D-ribose, about a two or 3,000 milligrams of each, then you'll start to find within a week you look in the mirror and you think, what's, what's different? Well, what's different is you're exercising and eating a plant-based diet is stimulating human growth hormone. And human growth hormone is what you really lose and that causes loss, loss of muscle mass. So now you're getting it back into your body and you're, you're doing the exercise which is keeping the muscles, getting, getting the fat out of the muscle and getting lean muscle and the protoplasm inside the muscle expanded. So within three months, you can go to, from being flabby and frail to strong and ripped and abs and cut muscles looking really good. It's not difficult. And that's what that message is about there. And then from Poznan University in Poland an article talking about ginkgo. And I'm a big believer between 300 to 500 milligrams of ginkgo a day because it increases microcirculation to the brain and to the extremities. Hence, you're going to have better circulation in your venous system. That, that is the blood coming back up to the heart and the lungs and expelling the carbon dioxide. And uh, that's why a lot of people get varicosities and spider veins and little splotches. This is what they say, quote, daily 160 milligram dose, that's a small amount, of a standardized extract of ginkgo biloba for six weeks was associated with improvements in maximal oxygen uptake and blood ion toxin capacity. And this was reported at the Academy of Physical Education and the University. So, this was published in the Peer Review Journal Nutrients. So get your ginkgo every day. And also, in the very near future, I'll let you know when, I'll be posting the reprints of two of my newest articles, which were accepted for and being published in highly respected peer review journals. So we continue to get information out on topics that are important. Now, before we go to our break... I want to also give you the latest update, why on the environment, because I can be in a place in my travels 
where they haven't had a single problem. So when you talk to them about global warming, it's it's not our problem. It's over there. They're in the wrong, they're in, you know, they're in Miami. And by the way, a new article just came up. I posted it on my Facebook page yesterday. <clears throat> it's one of the best articles I've read yet. It's citing only good quality climate science from respected institutions, and it shows you a map of Miami from about 50 years ago today and what is going to be the very near future. And here's the bottom line. You can read the article. Look at the photographs for yourself. Miami Beach and the whole area of Miami going up the coastline will be uninhabitable in the very near future. So my suggestion is, I I was a resident. I lived in Miami Beach. I lived in South Beach. And I had a prized penthouse, a unique place, because I bought mine uh, 20 years ago before anybody lived below 5th Street on Ocean Drive. It It was a really dangerous place. In fact, you were warned don't go down there unless you're going to Joe Stam- Stone Crab House, which I didn't go to. Um, the very, very famous restaurant, but it was at the tip, and everyone took a cab or drove there, and they had valet service, but you never walk there. And I saw right across from a park, a small park, uh, a billboard, a little billboard, a little trailer. They were building a building, a small building, only nine stories. I walked in, I asked him about it, and they said, well, it's all sold out. Well, okay. So I left a card, but turns out there was some apartments. The only apartments that were not sold out were on the top floor. So I made a deal. And I looked at what they were offering and what they were charging, and I said, wow, you're using Poke and Pole Kitchen, which the two best kitchens made in the world are Poke and Pole, in my opinion, Poke and Pole and Rock Butt. And I've had both in my homes. They're just beyond the best. And that's what they had. And they had poke and pole bathrooms and bidets and marble floors. and Very, very nice. I said, this is a lot of money. So you have no idea. I said, let me guess. You're putting a million dollars probably into finishing these apartments. Oh, we're going to best in the best in all South Beach. I said, well, okay, I'll take it great, we'll sign you up. I said, but I'm not going to give you that. I'm going to give you far less. Well, no, that's the price. But I don't want you to do any of that. I appreciate what you're doing for your other apartments, but just sell me a blank apartment. Nothing, just concrete. That's it. Just four walls. That's all I want. I'll do the rest myself. Why, Why would you do that? Well, because quite simply, I would be paying you to do what I could do myself, and I can do it a lot less expensive than you can, and I would be doing a lot of my own original design because landscape architecture is my passion and hobby, but also I love design, so I, I'll do it myself. They agreed, and, and I end up having one of the most beautiful places you could imagine, and I sacrificed that. I gave that up because sooner or later, if you overattach to something— and you're not looking at where you're at and what could be coming to it. And I saw after 15 years of enjoying it, it was only a matter of time before the streets flooded. The year I moved, sold it, which was recently, they started flooding. Now they're flooding every day. Now what was supposed to be an inconvenience only overnight, like from 1 o'clock to, I think, 4 o'clock in the morning, the noise of these gigantic turbines, now it's 24-7. And now there's not just a few. The entire area has got all these turbines. In spite of all that, they can't get the water out of the streets. So when you can't get the water out of the streets, and that's with no flooding, no, no storms, that's just normal surge from the rising sea, then you are in a bad place. So, okay, we've got $20 billion in real estate here. We can't, and we, that's, that's our tax base. What are we going to do? So the idea is, okay, we'll, we'll keep bringing in sand because sand gets washed out every single morning. 
and then we'll bring it in before daylight in barges and then have people bulldoze out. I was there running up in the beach every morning doing a 10-mile run. I saw it. And so when you've got massive erosion of your beach, you've got massive water in coming in, who then would continue to build, to sell, or to purchase something if you didn't do your homework? And that's the problem. We're not looking at, at, at our environment realistically. Here's what happened in the last seven days. Seven days. All right. One of the largest wildfires in western Greenland. Greenland. Yeah, could you imagine Greenland on fire? Yes. And that means massive amounts of melting of a glacier? Yes. So big is the melt that when you go up with a little camera, a little um, little camera attached to a, a, a drone, you can look down and it goes two miles down and it looks like a mini Niagara Falls. Billions of gallons of water into that hole every 24 hours, and there are thousands of these. And lakes, little I don't call them lakes, little, like little ponds. They could be five foot deep, three foot deep, 20 feet deep, and maybe 50 feet across, 100 feet across, everywhere. And that water's got to go someplace. So that's, now you've got fires there. Also, in the last week, we had a monstrous monsoon storms in Arizona. Now, what do I mean by a monsoon? If you've ever been to parts of India, Bangladesh, um, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Myanmar, you'll notice that when clouds come in in the monsoon, suddenly the, just, the sky opens up and torrential rain comes down. Huge amounts of rain comes down. Nothing you've seen in your life. We now have that in the United States for the first time this summer. In fact, I posted a photograph, and you will not believe what this photograph shows. It's right over Phoenix from last week. And it shows this huge cloud over all of Phoenix, and suddenly it opens. And it opens, and like hundreds of thousands of gallons of water drop out of the sky. It can immediately cause flash flooding. That's how much is coming out of a single cloud. Forget the old idea of it starts slow and it drops and then it rains and a little stronger rain and it subsides. I'm talking about the heavens opening and just it inundates. That's what's happening now across the United States. For those of you living in Miami, well, July was the hottest month on record. For those of you living out west, we have people li listening right now and syndicated stations carrying the program, and we thank you for that. 37,000 fires destroyed 5.2 million acres, and 47 large fires were still burning as of August. Didn't know about that. Seattle and Portland you hit in Seattle 104 and Portland 170 degrees. That's extreme for those two cities. You had extreme heat so bad that entire harvests of tens of thousands of acres of farmland in India were destroyed. The heat was so strong, it killed the plants. Now remember, there people borrow from money lenders at 20% interest or more to get their seeds, plant, and then they pay back with their harvest, a lot of those people will be committing suicide, which is unfortunate, but because if you commit suicide in India, your debt is not forgiven. Now you've got children and a wife who now have to go into debt peonage to pay for your, your debts. And yet the, the Indian government should be having massive loan programs of no interest, a zero interest to help these farmers. And they should be having educational programs in every single community in India to explain what, what this is about and that you're, you shouldn't kill yourself. And how many have killed themselves? Over 300,000. 
A week ago, over 200 people drowned and 130,000 were displaced by severe monsoon flooding in just one western state of Gujarat in India. In British Columbia, the second worst forest fire season on record. Killer heat waves are now called Lucifer waves in southern Europe. For those of you who are in the eastern Mediterranean, Serbia, across Croatia, parts of Italy and France and Spain, and you're looking at 111 degrees, that is completely uncommon for that area. And it's killing people, but it's also destroying crops. Killer floods and landslides were in Myanmar, which is old Burma. The hottest temperatures today, I just checked Baghdad, 120 degrees. Kuwait went, up, went down from 141 to 112. Uh, Riyadh, 109. Dubai, 104. And then we also had the worst uh, heat was in Vietnam, 131 degrees. They've never had that before. And Turbat, Pakistan, 120 degrees. A day before, 129, eastern Iran, Oman, 123, and Saudi Arabia, 119. That's just a tiny sampling of what occurred in the environment in the last seven days. But we didn't see any of that anywhere. And that's unfortunate because they don't consider this important. We do. That's why we bring you the information. I'm Gary Knoll. We're going to take a break, come back. I have some audio clips before we go to our guest and a commentary that we're going to share with you. So please stay with us. I'd like to welcome all of you. This is a program about empowering. And my guest on the air right now is Dr. Roy Spicer. Roy has a highly qualified background in water geology, in, in, in microbiology. And uh, I ask him on today for two reasons. The first is people are just finding out how bad and unhealthy their water supply is. We've been led to believe that unless you were in Flint, Michigan, and there was a water alert, that somehow everything coming out of your tap was okay. And secondly, this is getting worse than what we'd ever anticipated because now we're finding stuff in our water supply that can be in our body for a period of time before we know it. Meaning we, we might be drinking water that has parasites in it, and we wouldn't know it might take months, a year, two years, and then one day we end up in having a severe problem, and we think, why didn't I know? Why didn't someone inform us? So this is a wake-up call, and nice to have you with us today, Roy. Pleasure to be on your show, Gary. And Roy got his doctor from Rutgers University, and he's published in literature, etc. Roy, two questions for you. Take your time. This is a part of our environmental segment today. Tell us about our nation's water supply. Give us documentation in detail. And then give us an explanation of what this might do to the average person or their children or senior citizens or babies who are drinking this water and whose immune systems are not strong to begin with. The form is yours. Well, first, Gary, we live in a toxic world where exposure on a daily basis to toxic contaminants in water affects our health on a cumulative basis. Many disorders start very, from early life, and an example is if pregnant mothers ingest toxic water and food that's loaded with contaminants, it's going to have a negative effect on the fetus. And that starts the process for an unhealthy life. For decades, uh, toxic waste sites and indi industries have discharged chemicals and heavy metals that have seeped into the drinking water supplies. Additionally, agricultural runoff of pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizer, even hospitals and pharmaceutical companies have been dumping drugs into the ground, and that's contributed to hundreds of toxic contaminants permeating our drinking water supply. 
the recent study, uh, which came out uh, from the Environmental Working Group, uh, reports that nearly all of U.S. drinking water is contaminated with cancer-causing chemicals. That's the headline. So the Environmental Working Group, which is a nonprofit research organization and an environmental watchdog, released this uh, searchable database uh, about a week ago, and it shows that almost 50,000 public water systems in the U.S. are contaminated with dozens of harmful chemicals. Uh, they're reporting that some of these chemicals found in drinking water include arsenic, hexavalent chromium, radiation, uh, chloroform, perfluorooctanoic acid, and trihalomethanes, even uranium. And that's just scratching the surface. Uh, they're estimating from their research that they're finding over 267 different contaminants in the American water supply. Now, I've looked at water reports for decades, and I can tell you that the levels and types of contaminants have increased over the years. Uh, going back 20 years, you would just see maybe chlorine and some of the residual, possibly a few industrial chemicals. Today, you're seeing a whole range of contaminants, and we're looking at water quality reports that any consumer can look up on uh, the, their own website, which would be their town, just put in the name of their town, look up water quality report, and they'll get the re latest report, and they can see the list of contaminants and the levels of the contaminants in their drinking water. And this is very common. I see it every day. Uh, I look at dozens of water reports, and it's just a question of how many contaminants are in the water. Now, from the EWG, the Environmental Working Group, they looked at the contaminants, and they found that 93 of these contaminants were linked to an increased risk of cancer. And that includes over 40,000 water systems had these chemicals detected, and they were exceeding established federal or state health guidelines. So that poses a real risk to our health. But the problem is that a lot of these uh, water supplies have an average of the contaminant, and sometimes they exceed it, but there's really very little enforcement. Uh, the EPA doesn't enforce these violations. So, in effect, you're drinking water that's you have unknown amounts of contaminants, and it's guaranteed they're going to have some contaminants. So the issue is, you know, what are you really drinking? Well, let me go a little further here. Uh, uh, an attempt to get a handle on this, I've looked at a lot of reports. Uh, one of them came out of the Associated Press investigation, and several years ago they picked up on pharmaceuticals in the drinking water. This was uh, a study that detected over 46 different medications in the U.S. drinking water supply. And that affects over 41 million people who are drinking water contaminated with small quantities of pharmaceuticals. And that includes antibiotics, anticonvulsants, mood stabilizers, sex hormones, and even cleaning solvents, plus many more pharmaceuticals. So even though the president trace amounts, scientists, scientists are concerned that ingestion over a period of decades will have a significant health consequence, especially in high-risk individuals. That would be children, the elderly, people with weakened immune systems. Uh, many other scientific studies have documented the negative health impacts of consuming toxic contaminants such as chlorine, which is used for disinfection, and chloramine, which is a new disinfection chemical, which is a combination of chlorine and ammonia, plus fluoride and lead. Uh, chlorine byproducts, for example, so, uh, called trihalomethanes, THMs, they're listed as cancer group B carcinogens by the EPA. And human studies report associations between these trihalomethanes and increased levels of bladder and colon cancer, and in some cases, possibly miscarriages and birth defects. Uh, in addition, one of the most common contaminants found in the United States water supply is lead. Uh, Flint, Michigan was just the tip of the iceberg that focused attention on lead, which is commonly found in drinking water. Uh, according to a recent National Resource Defense Council study, elevated lead levels have been found in over 5,000 water systems, affecting 18 million people in the U.S. Over 3.9 million of these people are drinking water containing very high levels of lead, which is over 15 parts per billion. And this is a violation of the federal lead rule. So lead is a, a neurotoxin, and millions of children have been drinking water containing lead for years. And chronic lead ingestion can cause loss of memory, elevated blood pressure, 
reduced fertility, and has been determined to be a probable cancer-causing agent. So unfortunately, when you turn on your tap, what you're really drinking is not clean, healthy water. It's really a blend of toxic contaminants. When you combine all these toxic contaminants and our water, plus what they add at the treatment plant, and they're adding uh, substances such as aluminum, as I mentioned, chlorine or chloramine and fluoride, what you're really drinking is a toxic soup. Uh, fluoride, as you know, has uh, been studied extensively, and a certain amount is allowed by the EPA. They allow up to four parts per million, which is a very high level. As a matter of fact, uh, the Health and Human Services uh, several years ago determined that that was a too high a level. It was actually toxic, and their new guidelines have reduced the fluoride level to 0.8, which is still toxic. Uh, fluoride really joins lead and other chemicals to be uh, causing harm to the brain. Uh, there's a whole group of studies uh, published on the Fluoride Action Network site uh, that lists all the harmful effects of fluoride. Uh, they have increased levels of bone fractures from ingesting fluoride in adults. Uh, it, it may lead to um, developing both tooth, tooth enamel problems and a whole range of skin disorders. Uh, there's a lot of heavy metals in the water. Uh, commonly, I see in water barium, which can cause muscular weakness. Uh, in addition to fluoride, we sometimes see nickel, uh, which is another heavy metal that accumulates in the body. Uh, arsenic is sometimes found in water systems, and that can have neurological effects, and long-term ingestion may increase certain types of skin cancer. Uh, other things that we find in the water are pesticides, uh, commonly found in the Midwest, but it's also found in other areas, and nitrates. In addition, uh, occasionally we see naturally occurring radioactivity from uranium. Uh, sometimes there's strontium in the water. So there's a whole range of heavy metals that are commonly found in the water in addition to industrial chemicals. And th these are just some of the common things that we find. There are also special contaminants we see in the water. Uh, a new one is perchlorate. Perchlorate has come from fertilizer from the South of South America, also munition plants. Uh, it affects the thyroid of, uh, of the fetus. So children who are, uh, have their mothers drinking perchlorate may have low-functioning thyroids when they're born. So all in all, you're looking at a whole range of contaminants and pinpointing the exact number of toxins in the average glass of water is almost impossible. But the fact is that uh, you'll be drinking something with contamination in it. That, Roy, when you say, when you say there are 40,000 water systems, that's, that means that almost all of America, almost all Americans are drinking contaminated water every day because that's just about all the water systems in America. So what I'd like for you to do is we're going to come back with you. But we have to go also now to our guest, uh, Eva Gollinger, who's standing by, and Dr. Roy Spicer will return. Let's go over and say hello to Dr. Er, to Eva Gollinger. She is a Venezuelan American attorney who served briefly as a foreign policy advisor to the late Hugo Chavez. And using Freedom of Information Act requests, she continues to document the close relationship between the radical right factions in Venezuela and the U.S. government's action to overthrow the Chavez government. And she's received Mexico's International Journalism Award, award and one of the, the most prestigious in Latin America, and is a member of the Bar of New York and the Bar of U.S. Supreme Court, and also regional American legal bars. And she's a graduate of Sarah Lawrence University and got her uh, Juris Doctorate International Human Rights Law from City University of New York. And she's the author of two books, The Chavez Code, Cracking U.S. Intervention in Venezuela, and later, Bush versus Chavez, Washington's War on Venezuela. Her website is Eva, G O L I N G E R dot com. Nice to have you with us today, Eva. Thanks for having me, Gary. <clears throat> Eva, right now, all of the American media, I mean, all of it, shows that. Um, that the current president, who was selected by Hugo Chavez, uh, is killing his own people, and he is starving his people, that the entire country is an absolute breakdown in, in civil war, and he should be replaced. The government should be replaced. So we're only getting, once again, we're getting one side of the issue, and I invited you on to share 
what's really happening since you've been there, and American journalists haven't, and they do not see the power of the oligarchs and the commercial interests in Venezuela controlling the uh, what goes out to the rest of the world. So the form is yours to give us a quick update on what the truth is in Venezuela. Well, it is a very chaotic situation now, but it's certainly not the level that's portrayed in most U.S. media. And while there, there are foreign correspondents in Venezuela, they generally tend to associate only with um, the wealthier sectors, so they're not even reporting on the full picture. That said, I mean... This current government, which was elected after Chavez passed away in 2013 by a very slim margin, less than two points, um, you know, has has severely mismanaged the economy. So there's a lot of responsibility on the part of the government for what's happening now. And and certainly the most recent steps they've taken have strayed from what uh, Hugo Chavez's original political project was in terms of increasing participatory democracy in the country. I mean, a lot of it is the result of of this ongoing violence in the country. I mean, there there have been about 120 deaths from violent opposition protests over the past four months or so this year. And I guess what this official data is showing at this point is probably, you know, uh, there's it's not quite equal, but at least 30 to 40 of those deaths were caused by the opposition protesters themselves, some against bystander, innocent bystanders, others against themselves, self-inflicted, because, you know, these are not, I mean, there there are sectors of the opposition that have been advocating for more sort of peaceful democratic protest against the government. They're still calling for regime change, but there have been anarchical sectors of um, violent protests, anti-government protests, where they're using Molotov cocktails, they're using homemade firearms, regular firearms, bombs, and burning, you know, buses, buildings, cars, and people, and signaling anyone who they associate or they think could possibly support the government or Chavez. And there, I mean, there have been at least three of three documented cases of people burned to death by um, these opposition protesters because they suspected them of supporting the government. So, you know, I mean, just to give sort of a different portrayal, that doesn't in, in no circumstances justify any of the uh, government repression that's caused a significant percentage also of of those deaths in recent months. Um, At the same time, there have been several dozen prosecutions and charges brought against police and uh, National Guard who've engaged in, you know, repression against protesters that have resulted in deaths or severe injuries. So it's not as though the whole thing is just, you know, the government's responsibility. Um, and then again, the, the whole thing, the whole situation comes down to the fact that, you know, there's an opposition in Venezuela. Its leadership has consistently called for regime change. You know, they tried to execute a coup against Chavez in 2002. Ever since then, their entire agenda has been focused on regime change because it's comprised of, you know, a, over a dozen different political parties with differing objectives and, you know, they all want to take power. I mean, you know, there's a lot of divisions amongst them and they have different ideologies. Some are on the far right, some are on the far left. So they only have together their common objective of regime change. So that's what they've been fighting for. And the current government, you know, has obviously made some severe mistakes. That said, the term of the president is up um, at the end of next year. There's supposed to be presidential elections. And personally, my position all along has been advocating for dialogue and, you know, working within a democratic framework to prepare for elections next year instead of, you know, violently protesting in the streets to, for regime change to force the government out. And then and now the government, of course, responded by installing this um, supreme or super government body to rewrite a constitution that was already one of you know, the most lauded in the world. And it was actually done in this really open, transparent, participatory way led by Hugo Chavez himself in 1999. So that, that to me, has been disappointing to see that that's the path the government's taken. They've seen in many ways that that was the only path to try to create a national dialogue. Unfortunately, the opposition didn't participate. So it's a it's really a monologue amongst, you know, government supporters, which which are also diverse. So you know, there's some hope that at least some of the more critical voices within, um, you know, the movement that has supported at least this government or has maintained support for this government primarily because it's the sort of continuation of what the Chavez Bolivarian movement was. 
you know, there's some hope that 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 those more critical elements and within will promote change in a positive way. Um, but we're seeing at the same time all the international pressure, the sanctions from the U.S. government, the increased hostility and aggression. You know, now we have someone in the White House who's unpredictable, who's impulsive, who has a fragile ego and is looking for a way to make himself look like a strong man. And Venezuela is sort of the perfect patsy for him to go after because the, under no circumstances could they in any way, you know, stand up to the power of the U.S. I mean, they're trying as much as they can. But and then and then just to add, it comes down to, you know, this bizarre relationship between Venezuela and the U.S., the dependency on the oil, Venezuela selling to the U.S. dependent on the income, the U.S. dependent on Venezuela's oil supply for about 30 percent of, you know, our country's oil needs. So, I mean, you know, there's a lot of hostile rhetoric that goes back and forth. But in the end, the commercial relationship is so fundamental that at this stage, it seems like, you know, the rhetoric will remain as it is. But it does embolden the opposition to continue acting in a violent way um, to seek regime change. I appreciate you giving us this newsmaker update, Eva. At least we now have more balanced and objective understanding what is happening there. And I look forward to it, continuing updates as things evolve down there. Thank you for coming sure. on today, Eva. Anytime. Eva Gollinger, Thank you. just giving us a little update. I'm Gary Nall. Now, for those of you who've just come on board and we are still got a little bit of time left in our program, I wanted to complete our show today by playing a, a piece here that it deals with the problem that we always take credit. Every country takes credit for how they evolved their uh, democracies or their countries or their industries. You never hear them giving credit to the people who actually did the work. And that's the people that they kidnapped or enslaved. This is a professor of African history in Africa, Professor Patrick Lumumba. Let's listen to a little bit of what he has to say, please. Africans to seek to regain their independence from the colonial masters. Historians will remind us that we were first enslaved, that Africans were taken, and this we seldom say, the first civilization to take Africans out of this continent were the Arabs. And they took Africans from the eastern coast. And it's sad that in that part of the world, there are not many Africans who remained because it was in the business of the Arab enslaver to castrate Africans. We never say that. But we must say it, because it is historically significant. Then the Europeans came, the Portuguese came, the Spaniards came, the Germans came, the French came, the Belgians came. Africa became the hunting ground for the European colonizers, and we were the spot we built, our ancestors built the United States of America. Our ancestors built Europe. And when slavery had lost its shine and sheen, the Europeans abolished it. But they replaced it with yet another pernicious enterprise, the colonization of Africa. The Europeans sat in Berlin, in Germany, in 1884, and they looked at the map of Africa and puzzled it out. The British had their share. The Germans had their share, and Tanzania, or Tanganyika, was their share, as was Rwanda and Urundi. The Spaniards were Johnny come lately in the arena, and they got little Equatorial Guinea and Southwest Africa. The French were here, the Portuguese were here, and we were colonized. This time round, they did not take us away. They came here, 
and they controlled us and they told us not in so many words that we were children of a lesser God <laughs> and we were treated as if we were children of a lesser God in fact they told us that on the day of creation we were merely hewers of wood and drawers of water. And if anybody were to doubt it in 1948, it was more blatant when Hendrik Fafut instituted the apartheid regime in South Africa. But yet there is a sense in which the God that we worship never sleeps. Gavi was a buffalo soldier in the heart of America. And many of us will remember W.E.B. Du Bois. Many of us will remember that they started agitating that Africans must regain their dignity and their independence. And indeed, in 1847, in Liberia, a small group of Africans were brought back in Monrovia and Liberia became the first independent black nation in the continent of Africa. So soon thereafter in Sierra Leone, they also created yet another colony. But Africa was colonized except Ethiopia, which they tried to take in 1938 and exiled Professor Dr. Hale Selassie and unfortunately, they were defeated, as you remember, in the Battle of Adowa. Africa can defeat European tribes. And that is just part, I have the whole uh, speech, and it's really a valuable speech to listen to, talking about the emancipation of blacks around the world and in Africa from the colonists and the different stages of colonization and exploitation of their resources. And that's where we are today, where people exploiting the people and the resources of Africa. Worth listening to, yes. I'm Gary Knoll. Thank you all for listening. Have a nice day.